The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Welcome back from this, from this short break. Remember, by now, we know a little bit about how lasers work. We know how light amplification comes about. <clears throat> Excuse me. We even know how a laser starts. Now let's look at what causes the bandwidth of the laser. Okay? And what does that bring with it? What sort of properties of lasers will come with it? So here it is. We have the bandwidth of the of the amplifier, which is really the, the tuning range of, of the laser. So let me remind you that we're dealing now with a, essentially a three-level system where there's a pump that's creating a population inversion between the three and two levels. And as we've shown before, you know, we get gain at this, at this frequency, at this three to two frequency. And uh, the amount of gain depends, again, on some constants, but the key thing is the population difference. And the width, then, depends on what. And that's what we want to find out in this, in this section. Well, the width here can depend, is determined by all sorts of things. One is the fact uh, that there is spontaneous emission. As you know, when light decay, when atoms decay, they radiate uh, a, an exponential uh, uh, waveform. And that, just like we showed before, has a width. So if that was the dominant effect, then that the whole width would be essentially the effect of spontaneous emission. But in, say, something like a gas, we have collisions, and collisions can effectively shorten this, uh, this, uh, this uh, transition time, this decay time, and essentially will broaden the width. And, uh, and also the Doppler effect, because atoms are moving, there is, as we're all familiar with the, with the Doppler shift in the frequencies, again, that can cause uh, broadening. So this width here can be quite complicated. It could be made up for gases. It could be made up from spontaneous emission, collisions, Doppler, and what have you. And for solids, uh, for solid amplifiers, they have other broadening sources. So basically, this is not a trivial uh, width here, it, 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 uh, but it can be measured and then can be attributed to uh, all sorts of uh, effects. Now I see that uh, we have a phone call, so let's take this phone call uh, right now. Uh, Dr. Zicchio, uh, one quick question. Can you be a little louder, please? Uh, yes, one quick question regarding the pump. Where are you calling from, by the way? Hartford Graduate Center. Hartford? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, one quick question regarding the pump. Yes. Uh, could you just explain how that starts, if we were to look at the pump schematically, uh, is that some high voltage being applied, exciting those electrons? Oh, well, I tell you what, so far I just wanted to indicate that there is a pump. Uh, if you can wait just a little bit, I'm going to show you, uh, when I discuss the variety of lasers that they are, and show you what the pump is in each, in each case. Like in some cases, it's going to be light beam, in some cases will be uh, collisions, in some cases, it'll be electrons colliding with something, and in the case of the helium-neon, it'll be helium colliding with neon. So if you just wait a little bit and, and see how that goes, and then can uh, get back to me if I'm not clear. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Good. All right. So, uh, and I encourage you to, uh, to ask questions uh, anytime. Um, so then, then the width of the, just to summarize, then the width of the of the uh, uh, laser amplifier then is, as I say, is made up of all sorts of things. And, and of course, it depends on which is the dominant one. If there isn't a, uh, if the collision is not the dominant one, maybe the Doppler is. Or if the Doppler is not dominant, maybe the, the spontaneous emission lifetime is. And, and so on. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, we're going to have a certain width. And, uh, and, and now let's see what, what can happen because we have this, uh, this width. All right. So, so, in fact, this is the width that determines, actually, the spectrum of, uh, of laser light. All right. So let's uh, then do a little review here. Uh, we said before that uh, what I've drawn here, here's the amplifier. 
Here's the bandwidth of the amplifier. Here are the modes of the, uh, of the resonator. And here in dotted, I've drawn what I call the loss line, which is made up of 1 minus R, 1 minus reflectivity, uh, which is then equal to the transmission of the, the mirror plus the absorption of the mirror A. But whatever it is, that's the loss line. This is the loss that you have, the gain has to overcome before you, can, you get oscillation uh, over here. So in, in this, in this uh, situation, the gain is below the loss line and no lasing, no lasing occurs. All right? so, so the first thing we have to do in order to, to laze, then we have to increase the gain, the amplifier, above the loss line. In this particular case, there's, there's one cavity mode here, and as we mentioned before, then, then the, the gain here is bigger than the loss at this value, so therefore the laser will oscillate, spontaneous emission will start it off, and the output, you get this uh, delta function uh, output. All right, that's what we call is a, a, single, a single frequency laser. All right, now when we have more modes under the gain curve, like, like over here, in, in this particular case, the cavity spacing, remember it depends on the length of the cavity, so the longer the cavity, the closer the spacings are, because C over 2L is the separation. So in this particular case, I show three modes under the gain curve. Now, even at this mode here, there's enough gain to overcome the loss, because this is the loss line. So in a way, I'll get three laser frequencies uh, oscillating. And, uh, and of course, if the bandwidth of the amplifier were bigger, then I'll get even more frequencies oscillate. Now, again, if you don't believe me, we have a nice little demonstration for you. All right, a demonstration that is based on, on the spectrum of laser light. You know, so so the, the, the idea here is to have a way of examining this, this spectrum using a what we call a scanning fabry perot cavity or a high resolution spectrometer. And that will tell you whether the laser is oscillating in, uh, in one or two or three or more modes and so on. So now let's look at this demonstration on the spectrum of uh, laser light. The spectrum of laser light, for example, is the spectrum, is it a single frequency, or is it multiple frequency, or what have you. In fact, we're going to look at the spectrum of light from two lasers, two helium neon lasers. We have this laser here with external mirrors, and the one over here with internal mirrors. And the way we're going to look at the spectrum is by using the optical spectrum analyzer here. So now let me turn on the, this laser with external mirrors and the light from the laser then is reflected by this mirror and this mirror and here it is going right into this optical spectrum analyzer which is a scanning fabry perot cavity. The output of this spectrum analyzer then goes to an oscilloscope over there. As we can see on the oscilloscope, we have more than one frequency. In fact, we have several frequencies, sometimes three and sometimes even four. The spacing uh, of the modes here is about 270 megahertz, which is consistent with the length of the, of the laser cavity of 56 uh, centimeters. Now the first thing I'm going to do is see whether the polarization of all these laser frequencies is the same or not. So what I'm going to do is insert a polarizer in the beam and then rotate the, the polarizer. In fact, let me up the gain a little bit here. And let me rotate the polarizer or the transmission axis of the polarizer to see whether the polarization is the same for all of them. And as you can see, I can extinguish all of them when the polarization is horizontal and bring them all up 
when the polarization is, is vertical. And remember, this is, the, this is the light that was plane polarized. So now we've shown that indeed all the frequencies that come out from this laser, all of them are, are, uh, have the same polarization, the polarization in the, in the vertical plane. So now let me take the polarizer out and readjust the gain on the, uh, on the scope. So back now to the, to the three frequencies. You can see that they move around because the, the cavity is drifting in length due to the air currents or, or temperature effects or what have you. And even in fact, as I speak or as I tap on the cavity, you can see that I can create a mess of the, uh, uh, of the, of the spectrum just by simply uh, tapping. Or if I lean on the table, you can see again that I can make the frequencies uh, wander around. Now the fact that I have more than one frequency means there is enough gain for several frequencies to, to oscillate due to the fact that the gain medium has, has some uh, bandwidth. Not very huge, but some bandwidth. Now I can make the laser go at one frequency by, by introducing loss, by simply misaligning the cavity to introduce loss. So you can see here I've got only two frequencies and in fact I'm going to up the sensitivity of the of the scope because the power goes down when I misalign. You can see here whoop, I have essentially two two frequencies and if I add more loss I can I can have only one frequency. So in a way I can run this laser at one frequency, but it's, it's difficult to keep the other one out. And, uh, and then you can see that as I lean on the cavity, I can make this frequency move around. Now generally, that's not a good way of getting single frequency, and we have other techniques for getting single frequency, which we'll discuss later. For this laser, it's best to, to align it for the uh, highest power out, and and this way we'll automatically get more than, than one, uh, more than one frequency. And for a lot of applications, this is, uh, this is fine. All right, so to summarize then, uh, this laser that, that is 56 centimeters long, or the cavity is 56 centimeters long, then gives us about three modes, and the spacing between each mode is about 270 megahertz. And all the modes have the same polarization. Now we're ready to look at the, the other laser, the, the laser that has internal mirrors and also shorter in length. So when we come back, then we look at uh, that laser. Now we're ready to look at the spectrum of this laser here with internal mirrors. These set up for looking at the spectrum is the same as before, but let me just remind you of it. Here's the output of the laser, reflected by this mirror, this mirror, into the scanning fabry perot cavity. The output of the cavity then goes onto the oscilloscope over there. Now as you can see on the scope, and let me adjust the center of the scan, as you can see we have two big modes, and these are spaced by 680 megahertz, which is consistent with the length of the cavity, of the laser cavity of 22 centimeters, uh, given by the 50, uh, 680 megahertz is given by C over 2L, the spacing between longitudinal modes. So these are two longitudinal modes uh, of the laser. This little fella here is a, uh, is a third mode that's coming in at an odd position because the free spectral range of the scanning fabric pearl cavity is uh, not quite large enough, so we're getting a wraparound from another, another order. So let's not worry about this one uh, too much. So let's look at essentially the, the two main longitudinal modes uh, of this laser. 
Now let's uh, uh, let's look at now the uh, the polarization of uh, of these modes. So now what I'm going to do is take the polarizer and as we did with the other laser, let's take the polarizer and look at the, uh, the spectrum. Now, if we look at the scope, after I make a slight adjustment of the gain because of the loss in the, in the polarizer, now what I'm going to do is look at the spectrum of the laser light on the scope as a function of, of polarization. So first, you can see with the polarization set at this angle, you can see essentially we have predominantly one, one mode. And then if I rotate the transmission axis of the polarizer, I can extinguish this mode and, and bring, up, bring up the other one. Now let me just center the mode on the scope so I can bring up the other one. You can see indeed I have single frequency operation on just one mode. So I either have this mode here or if I rotate the polarizer I can bring up I can bring up the other one. So again let me go back to the first one and then to the one over here. Now this is different from what we had with a laser with external mirrors and 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 the Brewster windows where we found that all the modes were the same, of the same polarization. Now here we find that one mode is one polarization and, and the other one is polarized orthogonal to the first one. And in fact this, this explains why the output of the laser wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't plane polarized as, as in the external mirror cavity. Now this is very interesting that because we have internal mirrors the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the modes are, have orthogonal polarizations, at least adjacent modes have orthogonal polarizations. And in fact, this is a very easy way of selecting single frequency operation by uh, simply placing a polarizer uh, in, in the beam and then selecting, uh, selecting one, one frequency. Now let's, let's look at uh, the single frequency uh, behavior. If I want to tune the, the laser frequency, I simply blow some air onto, onto the laser to, yeah, I blew too much. Let's do it again. So you can see that I can scan the laser frequency by simply changing the length of the cavity. In this case, I'm cooling off the, uh, uh, the cavity. Now, let me also point out that the line width that you see, the line width that you see here is not the laser line width at all. Uh, the line width that you see here is determined by the scanning Fabry-Perot cavity. The line width, the true line width of the laser is, is very narrow. In fact, uh, uh, in principle, it's a fraction of a millihertz. Uh, but because laser jitters and what have you, you'll get a little broadening, but certainly nowhere near as, uh, as wide as what you, see, uh, what you see over here. And again, let me bring up the other mode, uh, the other polarization. And again, this one will also tune across the gain curve. of the cavity. I mean a gain curve of the uh, of the medium of the of the laser. Well I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration as well. Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned and as you know this is a it's a brief course, it's not too mathematical, so don't expect that you'll be able to answer all the questions uh, just based on, on this course, but I hope that this will, will trigger your excitement and maybe you want to go take other courses or maybe start opening up books. Now, there are still more <laughs> to, uh, to lasers, and uh, now what I would like to, uh, to get to is the, 
is the uh, optics of, of, of the laser beam. And that is, uh, you know, the shape, the shape of the laser beam that comes out from lasers. I I'm, I'm talked a little bit about it before, and, uh, and I'd like now to, uh, to start uh, uh, talking about it. Again, I'm not going to get into the math because this is not, uh, this is not the, uh, the right course for it, all right? So, so forgive me if, if I... Uh, if I uh, don't convince you uh, completely. But if you have any questions, please go ahead and, and ask it, and maybe this will give me an opportunity to uh, explain a little bit better what I, what I mean. So now, let's turn to the uh, optics of, uh, of laser beams. And, and as, as I mentioned before, the shape of, of, the, of the laser beam is determined by, by the mirrors. If you have two, two plane mirrors, then the, the, uh, the beam bouncing backwards and forwards here will be, will be collimated, and if you leak it out here, it'll be, it'll be collimated. Uh, if I had, let's say, a curved mirror and a plane mirror, then, then I'll have the beam shape inside the cavity will be something like this, will be big on one side, small on the other, and then, and then the beam leaving this mirror will, will also expand, just like it expands into here, will expand to the other side, so the beam will, will expand, depending on what we call the waist uh, of the beam. All right, now, uh, if you have two curved mirrors, let's say two concave mirrors, then, then the beam shape will look something like this, and again, will expand coming out. But uh, one shouldn't worry, because all you have to do, just like I showed before, with uh, lenses, you can bring it back to any size, to any size you want. Uh, and, uh, and for example, in this, in this next demonstration that, that we're going to have, uh, we're also going to do the, the following. We're going to put lenses uh, at the outputs of beams, and we're going to demonstrate uh, this region here uh, for you. And in fact, we're also going to put an aperture here, and we're going to clean up the beam because sometimes the lenses are not perfect, the uh, mirrors uh, of lasers are not perfect when the light goes through them, and there are all sorts of uh, distortions. So by putting an aperture here, what we call spatial filter, we'll clean up the beam and we'll have a very clean looking, uh, looking spot. So, uh, so when I think now we're ready for, for this uh, next demonstration on, on the optics of laser beams. And here, all we try to show you is, is the, the shape of, uh, of laser beam in, uh, in a tank of uh, water, because it's difficult to do that uh, in air, to visualize uh, the laser beam. Now, I want you to remember one thing. You know, I've been saying about how small the spot is and what have you, the focus spot. In, in this case, you're going to be limited not by uh, the laser, you're going to be limited by, by recording resolution, and especially TV resolution. So, so please don't think that the beam you're going to see, the narrow spot of the beam you're going to see, is really what it, is, is, is that big. It's really much smaller than that. And it's a limitation of, of, of let's say, of this medium of television right now that, that it looks big. But at least it will give you some idea of, of what this beam looks like. So I think now we're ready. Let's look at this, this demonstration on various aspects of uh, the optics of laser beams. The light beam from a laser is as close to an ideal beam as one can get. And what I mean by that is that the properties of this beam, the propagation properties, are limited by fundamental laws of physics, for example, laws of diffraction, and not by the properties of the light source. For example, a laser beam from a well-behaved laser can be collimated to a very small angle. This angle is determined by, as I say, the laws of diffraction, which is the wavelength of the light divided by the diameter of the beam. And it doesn't say anything about the size of the source or the properties of the source. And that is the ideal collimation limit on a, on a beam. At the same time, a laser beam can be focused to a very small spot. The size of that spot is again determined by laws of diffraction, which is the wavelength of the light divided by the diameter of the, of the beam 
multiplied by the focal length of the lens. And if we choose the diameter of the beam and the focal length of the lens about equal, then the spot size would be of the order of the wavelength of light. And again, doesn't say anything about the physical size of the light source or what have you, as we would have uh, in a case of a, an arc lamp or any other kind of uh, light source. Now, in these demonstrations that follow, we're going to illustrate some of these basic properties of, uh, of laser beams. What we're going to start with is this laser here, which is a helium neon laser. And here is the beam from the laser. We're going to reflect it by this mirror here and then reflect it again by this mirror here and let the beam fall on the, on the screen. Now, you might be able to get a, a better feeling for the beam if I use the black card. Maybe the colors will come out better. So here is essentially the beam coming out from, directly from, uh, from this uh, laser. And it's very difficult, very difficult to, to tell what's going on. It looks pretty pretty, uh, pretty collimate. Now, what the first thing I'm going to do is, is expand the beam and see, and see what it looks like. So I'm going to take a short focal length lens and I'm going to place it in the way of the beam. And here on the screen now, we see, we see the, uh, we see the, uh, the expanded beam. Now, if we go take a close up, we can see that uh, it's got rings and what have you. Now these, these rings that you see or these fringes are due to the fact that the laser beam has to go through optical components like the output mirror of the laser it has to be reflected by these mirrors and then has to pass through this lens over here. And, and they all corrupt the, the laser beam. But we can easily get rid of these effects by placing a pinhole, here is the, uh, here's the, here's the pinhole. And, and what I can do, I can just place the pinhole in front of this lens, or at the focus of this lens here. And uh, if I have my adjustment right, I have then so-called the spatially filtered uh, laser beam. As you can see on the screen now, we got rid of the all these rings and this is as close to an ideal laser beam as one one can get. Now what we see here is is the the speckle. So if I move the screen a little bit you can see I can wash out the speckle. So when it's still you can see the the speckle pattern because the surface is not uh, is not smooth. But otherwise you don't see any any fringes uh, on the beam. And also uh, the, the, there's an intensity distribution which is, which is essentially Gaussian uh, squared. The field is Gaussian, but the intensity distribution is, uh, is Gaussian squared, so that essentially drops off to zero in the, in the wings. All right, so this is, this is a so-called spatially filtered laser beam, and for some experiments, it's very important to, to uh, spatially filter the beam, especially in interferometry and, and what have you. Now, I'm going to uh, well, no, before I do anything else, I'm going to show you that, that uh, the placing of the pinhole is, uh, is very critical. If, I, if we can now take a close up of the, of the spot, now if I move the pinhole slightly, you can see that, that the, first of all, the beam disappears because this pinhole is only uh, of the order of about 12 microns or so. And another point that one has to watch out for when using such a pinhole as a special filter, is that if the pinhole interrupts any part of the laser beam, the, now let's look at the, the, the inset again, that this, this Gaussian distribution in the beam gets, gets affected and you will start to see all kinds of uh, diffraction rings. So again, for the special filter to work, the, the, uh, the, the pinhole must not cut any of the essential part of the, of the laser beam. Now, what I'm going to do is, is collimate uh, this, this beam of light. And here, what I will use is a, uh, a simple two-lens uh, two collimator. 
and uh, I'll place it over here and uh, and here it is here's the here's the output from the from the collimator on the black card you can see that obviously you can't check on the exact collimation but you can see that the beam can be can be uh, simply uh, uh, collimated all right now the next thing that one sometimes wants to do wants to focus the laser beam again if I take a simple lens and again place it in the beam now I can focus let's look at the beam again I can focus it to a tiny spot and back out again here we are you focus the small spot. Now, it's very difficult to see the size of the, of the spot or even the shape of this focused Gaussian, Gaussian beam. Remember I said before that it can be focused to, to a spot size of the order of the wavelength uh, of light. And it's not so easy to see it on this card. So what we're going to do when we come back, we're going to uh, get a water tank and pass the light beam, the focused light beam, laser beam, into the water tank and we'll add some scatterers to enhance the, uh, uh, the, 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 the scattering from the laser beam by the water and then you'll see you get a better picture for, for the focusing of, uh, of this Gaussian uh, laser beam. So when we come back we'll have that all ready for you. We have now placed the water tank in place so that we can pass the laser beam through it and visualize the, the laser beam as it passes through the, through, the, through the water. We've also, here is the tank by the way, and uh, we've also added a few drops of milk to enhance the scattering. And that's why the water looks murky. In addition, we've tilted the tank a little bit so that we can get a better angle for the, for the camera. Now, the setup is just like we had it before, but let me remind you of it. Here's the laser, is the beam from the laser, reflected by this mirror here. Then we pass it through a polarization rotator here so that we can adjust the polarization for uh, maximum uh, scattered light for the camera. And then the output after the polarization rotator gets reflected by this mirror here into this short focal length lens the spatial filter we had before, and then the collimator. The output of the collimator is here before it goes into the tank, and then out here after it leaves, leaves the tank. Now in order to visualize the beam as it propagates in the water, we'll have to turn the room lights down. But let me tell you what I'm going to do when the room lights are down. I'm going to first look at the collimated beam in the water and then I'm going to take this lens and another lens like this and I'm going to place it over here so that we can focus the light into into the tank All right. so and then we can explore the region around around the focus so now we're ready to turn the room lights down and look at the region around the focus uh, by simply observing the scattered light uh, in the water. Now that the room lights are dimmed and the camera focused into the tank, first thing we see is, is the collimated beam or the scattered light associated with the collimated beam. There's not much I can really say uh, about that. More interesting is when I put a, a lens before the, before the tank and look at the focal region. Here we are, I'm going to adjust the position of the lens so that the waist or the focused region, the focal region is in the center of your, of your screen. Now the things that you can observe is that laser beam coming in from, from the left then is then focused to a uh, a region where the spot is small, spot size is small, and then expands again on the other side. 
Now, because of the limitation of television recording, uh, especially recording of color, especially red, you do better if you want to see how narrow that focal region is. You do better if you turn down the color, turn off the color, and look at it in black and white. If you do that, you'll see that, that the, the focal region is now narrower than it is when, when it's red. But in fact, the truth is that you cannot really observe in this way the, the, uh, the true size of the, of the f focused spot, because that's only uh, a few microns, and it's going to be limited by television resolution uh, in, in any case. But at least you get a feel for the fact that the beam is pretty narrow at the, at the focus. Another thing you want to observe is that the region around the, the focus is, is reasonably uh, constant in, in, in diameter. And that's called the Rayleigh region, where the expansion of the beam is not so big. But after that, then the beam expands one side and then symmetrically, symmetrically the, the other side of the beam. The intensity distribution, if I take a slice anywhere along the beam, the intensity distribution is still Gaussian or Gaussian squared. The field distribution is Gaussian, intensity is Gaussian squared. The, the other uh, thing to observe is that the curvature. Now, at the focal, at the focus, or at the, at the, the middle of that Rayleigh range, what we call the focus or the waist of the beam, the curvature is, the radius of curvature is, is, is infinite which means that we have a plane wave. Now, the, it stays plane within the Rayleigh region, or close to plane, and then, then we develop the curvature. So we have an expanding beam on one side, an expanding beam on the other side. And in fact, if we go far away, the curvature, the radius of curvature, is the same as if we had a spherical wave starting at the, at the waist. All right, that's with this lens. Now I'm going to take this lens off and place another lens that is a little shorter in, in, uh, in focal length. And here we are. Oh, I have, let me turn it around. And then let me again center it so that you can, uh, the waist is the middle of your screen. You can see now the divergence is, is different, showing that it's a shorter focal length lens. Now if I'm Move it to one side, you can see that the beam gets quite big very quickly, and also the same to the other side. And then the, the and then the, but the other thing you notice is that the Rayleigh range, or well, the region around focus now is smaller, so it's a tighter uh, focus than in the previous case. And as the, as the uh, focal length of the lens gets bigger and bigger, then the Rayleigh region gets bigger and bigger also. So here we are with a shorter focal length lens. And again, if you want to see a nice small focal region, then you want to turn down your color and look at it in, uh, in black and white. Well, now you can say that you know all about the nice things uh, about a laser. In this next part, I'm going to start telling you about, uh, about sort of problems uh, that, uh, and other issues about, uh, about lasers. In fact, I call it uh, other issues and problems relating to lasers. The, the first one is, and again, without doing any math, uh, I want to tell you about, uh, about amplifier limitations and, uh, and what can go wrong in, uh, in amplifiers. All right, so here we go again. We have our three-level system, which is the simplest of amplifiers. We have, we have the pump. And, uh, and then we take some of these atoms from here, put them up here, and we have a population difference. And, and uh, if there were no lasing, uh, as we mentioned before, these atoms here would drop down to level two and through spontaneous emission, just like uh, a slide over here. So if you just leave the, the amplifier alone, 
and there is no uh, cavity, let's say, then what happens is that the, uh, the atoms will drop by spontaneous emission and, uh, and there will be no, uh, and, they, and then uh, they all, after a while, will all, drop, uh, will all drop down by emitting spontaneous emission. If there is a cavity and spontaneous emission gets the laser going, then what's going to happen is that these atoms will be driven down by stimulated emission. Now, as you can see, as you drive these atoms down, they're going to go to this level 2. And we have to know what happens to them when they're in level 2. If, level two, if the atoms can't get out of level 2, then as you can guess, sooner or later, level 2 is going to have more atoms in it than level 3. And as we know, that's a no-no in lasers. That means it becomes absorption here, not gain because n lower now is bigger than n upper, so we have a problem on our hands. So this, then this laser then, if the, then will become like a pulse laser because you start with gain, a lot of gain, and if you laze, it will laze for a short time until the populations are e equalized and then boom, the laser goes, goes out. So the, the question now is, uh, well, what do you do about it? If, if indeed level two starts to fill up and, and won't go down. Again, you have to, you have to solve that problem. So what, what you do, you have to come up with a way of making this level here uh, decay down, either through spontaneous emission by choosing the right system, or maybe by adding uh, other gases or what have you to, through collisions to bring the, this level down by, by collision. There are many tricks. And so, so a, a, a continuous laser then has to have a mechanism for getting rid of this, this bottleneck of this level two. It has to bring it down so that, and it's got to be fast, much faster than these things coming in. Because otherwise, then this is going to build up and you have, just like backing of water tanks, uh, it'll just back up, the water will back up and will not, will not go away. So, so the, uh, the key thing here is that to make the relaxation time here, what we call gamma 2, 1, which is 1 over the effective lifetime between level 2 and 1, to be bigger, bigger gamma 2, 1 has to be bigger than, than uh, gamma 3, 2, which is 1 over tau 3, 2. So in order to maintain N3 minus N2 as something uh, positive, more than 0, in the steady state, then we need to uh, have this gamma 2, 1, this decay rate here has to be faster than, than the decay rate into level 2. The rest is the constants, is like n1, the number in the, uh, in the uh, lower level, plus the power in the pump, and so on. But basically the key things are that these uh, relaxation rates, that this one is bigger than this one. If not, then essentially you get a, uh, a pulse laser. And uh, as it we'll see later, in, uh, in uh, different amplifiers, this is taken care of uh, uh, differently. All right, so obviously this is a problem that you, you've got to uh, worry about. That's why you don't make anything lace. Some, some materials make better lasers than others. All right, that's about one of the problems in amplifiers. Now let me talk now about something even more basic. Okay, and that's about cavities, where cavities can, can go wrong. So, so my topic here is on, on, uh, on cavities. And so far, we, we've talked about uh, cavities with curved mirrors, and, uh, but we haven't said anything about the spacing between, between the two mirrors. If, the, if, let's say, these are two concave mirrors and I bring them close, then the mode inside will look something like this, a little fat waste here. If I pull them apart a little bit, then uh, I, I begin to get a mode that looks like this with a, with a waste here that is smaller. And, and also, I didn't, uh, I'm not really doing it here because I'm not going into the details, but basically the curvature of the field inside the cavity at the mirror is the same as the curvature of the mirror so that you can get reflection back again. All right? So we're not really going into that uh, in, this, in this course. Now, if I pull the mirrors even further apart, I see that I... I create this waste here, which is very small. It's about this small, uh, it becomes very small, much smaller than I've had it before. Then what happens when, when I pull the mirrors even further apart from that, from that condition, all right? So let's see, let's, see, let's see what happens in this simplified version. Well, this is what's going to happen. If I pull it 
if I pull the two mirrors now further away than, than in here, then what, what happens is the light starts to walk out, will not be contained inside the cavity. Because what's nice here is the light's getting refocused back into the cavity and it's going backwards and forwards without leaving the cavity. And it's all in, these, in, all these, in all these cavities. But here, uh -uh, I exceeded some rule and, and the light will start uh, walking out, which means now in order to make this laser, I have to have much bigger amplifier to overcome this loss. Usually lasers will, will quit lasing unless you have a very high uh, gain uh, medium here. And this is called the unstable, so-called unstable resonator. All these others are stable, we call stable resonators, and unstable. I know I haven't used many formulas in this, in this course, but uh, here is one. Here's a simple one, I'll give it to you. So if you, this is in terms of, uh, in terms of the radii of curvature of the mirrors. This is row one and row two. And they can be uh, concave or convex. If they're written for concave, but if any of the mirrors are convex, then you have to change the sign. L is the separation between the two mirrors. And this little formula here tells you when the cavity is unstable. It turns out the cavity is unstable when, when uh, 1 minus L over rho 1 times 1 minus L over rho 2, the product of these two quantities, is, uh, is uh, if it's between 0 and 1, then the cavity is stable. If it's outside that, the cavity is unstable, and this is one example where the cavity is unstable. So you can have the best mirrors, you can have the best amplifier, but if you don't have the alignment right and the length separation right for given curvatures, the laser will not oscillate, and people think you don't know what you're doing. But all you have to do is go back to this formula and make sure that you stay, you stay inside it. So that's, that's a problem with a with, uh, common problem with, uh, with resonators. And this uh, also tells you, this formula also tells you whether you can use convex mirrors. And it turns out, again, on in certain conditions, you can use a concave mirror and a convex mirror. But to use two convex mirrors, that's a no-no, because that will not satisfy this condition. And as I say, if you're more interested, then you have to consult uh, uh, the literature. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the, uh, the, the spectrum of a laser in, in more detail. Now, before, we, we said that uh, the laser will be single frequency if you have only one mode under the gain curve. And if you have more than, more, more than one mode, then you have more frequencies. At least the possibilities of more frequencies oscillating. Now, a lot of applications uh, can't tolerate more than one frequency. For example, communication, interferometry, holography, and all these, a lot of sensors, they cannot tolerate more than one uh, frequency. But so for some other applications, you know, it's fine, like uh, uh, materials processing, medical applications, CDs, and so on. Uh, you, you know, more than one frequency is, is okay. So now let's see how one can select a single frequency from a essentially a multi-frequency laser. Now, in the demonstration, we showed you that uh, we showed you that uh, all these modes can can happen, and we showed you that if we lower the gain or misalign a little bit, we can bring the gain down so only one mode will oscillate. But that's not a smart way of doing it because you lose a lot of power output. So the idea here is to have how do you how do you have a, a long laser, right, with lots of possibilities, lots of modes. A lot of gain in there, and only select one one uh, one frequency out of that uh, out of that mess of frequencies. Okay, so let's see now uh, how we might uh, do it. So this section then is on the single frequency uh, selection, and uh, and I remind you again of having let's say a long cavity here with a, a long uh, uh, gain medium, and uh, and I have lots of modes under the uh, bandwidth of the amplifier. Here's my loss line. So all these modes here will oscillate, and you can get all these, all these frequencies. So the question here is how do I select then uh, one of these frequencies and not, and not all of them? Well, there are many ways. The, the most common way is what we call an etalon. We place this shorter cavity within the, the uh, long cavity. Again, uh, over here we have the modes of the, of the long cavity where there's all space C over 2L apart. And, uh, and for the short cavity, the length is A, so the modes are spaced for this cap. It's a piece of glass or two mirrors that are parallel. And the spacing is A, so the mode spacing is C over 2A for this short one. So now the whole idea is to couple the mode from this cavity, like this one here, with one of the modes from the long cavity, which is over here. 
And, uh, and when they're coupled, when they're perfectly coupled like this, then only at this frequency will I get enough gain to overcome uh, the loss in the, in, the, in the cavity, and the laser will oscillate over here at this frequency, which is determined by the overlap of these two, product of these two. Now at any other frequency, while before they oscillated, now they see this, this uh, 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 loss because of this, because the, you're off resonance with respect to that cavity, so the transmission is, is, is low, and then, and then you, they, will not, uh, they will not oscillate. So only, only the overlap uh, between the short cavity and the, and the long cavity, uh, the, then you will get enough gain to overcome the loss, and then you'll get, you'll get lazy. At any other value, you don't. So this is a way of selecting single, single frequency. Now, if you don't like this frequency, you want some other frequency, all you have to do is you tune, you tune this, this little cavity either by rotating this or by adjusting the distance. So you can move this resonance around and you can select any of these modes you want. If you want somewhere in between, then not only you have to tune the short cavity, but you also have to tune the, uh, the long cavity. And, uh, and then this, this is, a, as I say, this is a very popular way of, uh, of getting uh, single frequency. Uh, and, uh, and it's used uh, quite a bit. It's a pain in the neck to put things inside the cavity because any loss then will, will start cutting your, your gain down. Uh, an effective gain and your laser output power will, uh, will drop. But this is a, a convenient way of getting single frequency. So you don't have to worry about the fact that lasers can put out many, many frequencies. There are techniques to select only one and to be able to, to tune that. Now let me uh, talk about uh, other problems with, uh, with lasers, and that is the in frequency and intensity variations. And then we'll do that very briefly because, you know, one is thinks, begins to think that lasers are always ideal, they're not. Let's go back to our simple picture of, uh, of a laser and here's the gain, here's the cavity mode, and here's the, uh, here's the oscillation of the laser. Now, what determines this frequency? Well, as we've seen from way before, we, we saw that it depends on this integer q, which is the number of half wavelengths between the two mirrors, multiplied by c over 2l. So it certainly depends on l. So if l changes, if l changes here, then the cavity mode will change and of course will pull the fr laser frequency with it. So, so that the laser frequency can move around if the cavity uh, moves around. And, uh, and, and then a simple expression here for delta f over f, the change in the frequency over the frequency, is simply the change of the length of the cavity, or what we call the optical length, because if there's a refractive index uh, here that will change the physical length, because you have to multiply by the refractive index, divided by L. So then the change in the frequency, the fractional change in frequency, delta f over f, is the same as delta L over L. So if you want good stability, you have to keep delta L over L small. The, uh, the other thing is the, uh, is the intensity of the laser. What determines the intensity of the laser and, and does it stay constant? Well, we know that the amplifier, of course, determines the intensity. And, uh, and the, but the change in intensity will depend on uh, the pump. If the pump here changes uh, whatever it does to the, to the medium, if it changes magnitude, then it's going to uh, change the intensity. Or if you misalign, as we showed you in the demonstration, if you misalign one of the mirrors here, you will get more loss, which means that you need more gain to overcome the loss, which means the intensity will drop, and so on. So there are many ways of reducing laser intensity. So to keep it constant, all right, to keep delta I over I small, then you need to keep an eye on all these, uh, on all these effects. Okay, and I think this is about, brings me to, to the end of this, uh, of this session. Uh, in the next session, we're going to talk about another property of lasers, and that's associated with, with transverse modes. These are, these are the, 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 when you look at a laser that's oscillating in transverse modes, instead of seeing the single spot, you see uh, many kinds of, uh, many spots, and that for some applications is a, is a no-no and you've got to get rid of them.